Great. Okay. Great. So as you heard, um, the recording is in progress. Um, you know, you don't have to have your videos on, um, but uh, I think we can oh. get started. Oh, wait. So uh, would, would you like to introduce yourself, Dami? If, if oh, I'm sorry, Dami. I missed you. <laughs> yeah, and any other TAs after Dami as well. I just have a little bit of background noise. So it's Dami. I'm a graduate student at the University of Victoria here in Canada. Um, I used to work with the Minister of Health. So that was my first interaction with her. That was um, last year. And um, yeah, so I've been using her since 2019, actually. Nice to be here. Yep. And Julianne, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, thank you. Hi, I'm a fourth year PhD candidate at Northwestern studying health and biomedical informatics. And I use R every day to study health outcomes after stroke. And I've been using it since 2018. Great. Um, if you have questions, just as a reminder, put them into the chat so we can have lots of, there's all the TAs and everybody can interact with them. Ted just posted again in the chat, the link to the RStudio cloud. Um, and so we're going to get started. Um, uh, I will start and then we'll hand it over to, to Daniel. Okay. So can I get a thumbs up if you can see the screen? Great. Um, uh, you'll have access to all the materials after the, uh, or they're all available to you in the R Studio Cloud, but they'll be available also on GitHub afterwards. Um, so just a little bit of background. <laughs> if you, uh, if this doesn't fit you, maybe you can run away and not spend three hours here. Um, but why should you come to this workshop? Um, we'll talk a little bit about um, why you might want to be using R. Um, we'll write some of your first R if you've never written R or also, if it's been a long time, well, you know, if, if you haven't heard the word tidyverse before, um, you're going to learn a lot of stuff today. Um, and then we're going to show some things and not dive too deep into them, but to just kind of give you, get you excited and, and give you a flavor of what's possible in R and the R ecosystem. Um, so I think we can see skip this for the R workshop because we're all here. Um, okay. Um, I'd like to take this moment just to pause to say um, if um, you are having issues getting things set up, please message in the chat sooner rather than later. Um, and then Daniel, do you want to take it from here, or do you want to keep me or have me keep going with the introduction kind of orientation? Uh, you can keep going until after our studio cloud. <laughs> Perfect. Um, okay, so uh, let's blow this up a little bit. I I love this graphic. Um, Allison Horst is you know a very prolific. Um, I don't even know what the the category to put her in, but like amazingness, and she has this. Um, she's a very good illustrator, and I think this graphic encapsulates a lot of like what it is on learning R. Like when you start, it can be really frustrating. You're like, I can't like which window am I supposed to be typing into? Like I, I don't I don't get it. Um, then you start to have some progress, and then you start to be doing like kind of like more difficult things, and you're gonna hit the valley of despair of like, oh, I don't get it. Like Ted said, like oh maybe this just isn't for me. I, you know, I didn't learn how to program when I was 16, so I'll never learn to program. False, false, false. Um, and then one thing I think is amazing about the art community is the, the, how, the high quality of um, just random people's blog posts showing what they've done, the people on Twitter sharing work they've done, um, offering to help each other. Like I, I posted once like, oh, I'm thinking about making a package. And I had like 20 different people in my DM saying like, if you need any help, you know, reach out uh, to me. Um, and then you're just gonna get really comfortable with always learning. Um, Ted, Danielle, you guys have little other little tips, thoughts? 
Uh, so the the R stats hash, hashtag is amazing on Twitter. Um, I've met a ton of people through it, and everyone is super helpful. So if you have any if you have any questions, and you don't think you can't find the answer, oftentimes I will ask it on Twitter with the R stats hashtag, and someone will get to me, which is pretty amazing. Um. Great. So um, just giving you a little bit of background on our Studio Cloud. Um, for this workshop, we're going to be using um, our Studio Cloud. Why? Well, our Studio Cloud is like a fantastic way um, to teach R and also to um, uh, to get people who are new to R up and running without a lot of the friction points that can happen with local installation issues on your local computer. So there's nothing that you need to download um, with our Studio Cloud, um, and this just as a reminder, you don't need to use our Studio to use R, but I do, and lot, lots and lots of people do, and it's a very friendly way to interact um, with R. Um, the good thing about our Studio Cloud and um, our Studio that you would download onto your computer is they look very, very similar. So even if you're learning things on our Studio Cloud. Those are going to directly translate into it once you would have it on your local machine. Um, and both R and R Studio are um, free to download to your computer. Okay, so at this point, I want everybody um, to log have already logged on to R Studio Cloud. If not, um, do so now. We're going to paste it again into the to the chat um, uh, to go there. Um, either please raise your hand in the Zoom session or um, put a message in the chat. When the speakers are speaking, it's, it's a little bit difficult for us to look in um, the chat box, but TAs um, are gonna be on uh, the prowl for the questions. Um, if some, if TAs or other instructors happen to see like a really important question, please like just interrupt the speaker so we can address it and clear it up for everybody. Yeah. Um, just one thing, if you're feeling uncomfortable, like messaging the whole group, feel free to message the TAs individually um, because they are really good and, you know, they can help you, so. Excellent. Okay. Um, so uh, you, if you clicked on that link to get into the project, you're going to see something that looks similar to this. If you don't, let us know in the chat. Um, but once you see that, that intro to R for medical data, um, just click on it and open it up. Um, it does take a few seconds to, to load. Um, and while we're waiting for that, um, I just want to show you the, the orientation of the space that you're going to see. Um, so these are the four panels, panes, I guess, um, that you're gonna see on RStudio, whether it's on your local computer or on RStudio Cloud. And so going clockwise, starting with pane one called source, um, we'll talk quickly about um, what, uh, what each of these do. So source is generally where we're gonna be doing a lot of our work. Um, that's where you're going to be writing your code, um, and we're in this uh, special file, which we'll talk about a little bit later, called R Markdown, and you can actually run your code in there as well and see the output up there. Um, if you're creating new files, you're going to see um, um, that in there. Um, two, um, over there in the top right corner, you're going to see the environment. Um, and that is gonna be when you create something from your programming. For example, you read in an Excel file and name it something, you're gonna be able to look over there and see it um, the, as the R version of that object. Um, ooh, I guess I should have been more conventional in my naming of numbering of things, but then we're gonna <laughs> go to four from two into files. And here's where you're gonna see the files that are associated with um, your project. Um, and you're gonna see there's kind of like tabs, much like a, a, a browser situation where you see things like plots, help and viewer, and we'll go into that 
uh, and some more details. But for there, we're going to open something up soon in the files um, uh, uh, area. So be looking there. And then the final place here is the, the console or terminal both um, and and this is where you could it just directly enter in code and run it um, when you're not like kind of when you're just doing kind of quick things or or running scripts and stuff like this I don't do a lot here um, because it's easy to lose your work when you're down here so um, don't worry much about it as you're starting out in the R um, you as you get more advanced you'll see what the advantages are of, of things down there okay so now um, for a uh, very quick orientation to our markdown, I want everybody to go into this um, files area right here and look for the intro to R for medical data workshop, the RMD, and open that up. something like this. Um, and make sure it's the RMD and not .html or anything else like that. Um, it looks like um, the little icon around it is like a little piece of paper with a red circle on it. Um, and I guess uh, if, if people are there, could I get some thumbs up in the, in the in the reactions just to see if people are getting there. Great, great. Um, okay. And well, this, the document that you're seeing that you've opened up from that is not the same as this um, uh, image here. Um, I want to talk about just some of the very generic components of um, an R markdown file. So you can imagine an R markdown file is a combination of code and tech, like text. Um, and there's like finer details, so things about that. Um, and so the big three chunks you're gonna see at the top of a document is gonna be something called YAML. And we're not gonna really talk anything more about this, but just know that there's ways to make your, um, uh, documents super customizable um, with multiple authors, like how you want citations formatted, just like crazy stuff. But for right now, you don't really need to know anything more about YAML for the rest of <laughs> today. Um, and then you're going to see these gray sections of the document that are um, offset by these um, uh, back ticks and some curly brackets here. And this is a code chunk. And it means that you have put code in there and then you can execute that code by hitting the little run button, which is the, the triangle over here. Um, and then the, the final component is this um, text, which is, it's really just text as if you were typing in a Word document and an email or something. Like this. Um, you can use a markdown syntax R has its own little dialect of R or of Markdown, but very compatible um, uh, or very similar. Um, I think I've said all of this. Daniel, Ted, if you have other things to um, uh, say, jump in now, or else I think we're going to have Daniel start talking about exploring some data. Okay, um, I uh, am going to stop sharing unless, Daniel, do you want me to share my screen of the RMD? Or are you going uh, to? I, I can do it. Perfect. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing. Um, hopefully this works. All right. Okay, so... Uh, what Mara had said that hopefully you have the intro to R for medical data workshop .rmd open. Um, if you scroll down a little bit, you'll notice that um, there is like a published version of this. Um, a lot of the things she was saying was already covered in the first 
up until um, about 100, uh, line 147. So everything that she showed that was rendered all nice and pretty was essentially the document that was rendered up until this point. Um, right now, since there are pieces of this code that we are going to work together and fill out, uh, you won't have that pretty, you won't have the ability to render this without um, having errors happen because we literally blanked out and invalidated invalidated our code. Um, but hopefully by the end of uh, this workshop, you should be able to render and get like a nice pretty website view of everything that we're working on. So at least for me, um, and if you didn't add in any new lines or anything, at about 148, you will see your first um, R block that we're going to work with. And so you'll notice that these back ticks, so on a standard US keyboard, it is the key to the left of the number one, it is a back tick. Um, I believe if you're on like the A-Z-E-R-T-Y uh, Azerty keyboard, it's like where the number six is, I think it's somewhere around there. Um, but the, between these two uh, sets of back ticks, you'll notice that in the RStudio cloud or in RStudio, uh, the background's going to be a little bit different. It's gonna be grayed in. And this is your visual cue that RStudio is understanding this block as R code that you can run versus regular prose text that uh, will be displayed um, in like a nice pretty format. And so in this set of uh, these blocks, you can run or, you know, R is a glorified calculator. So you can run this code uh, in one of two ways. On the right-hand side, you can click this little play button and you'll notice that it will take the code that's in here, which is right now one plus two, and it will return three at the bottom. And I'll make this a little bit bigger. Since if you are planning to follow along, um, we are going to be uh, writing a bunch of code. So if you do want to write notes to yourself, you can use this hash symbol. So that is shift and a number three on your keyboard and you can write a comment. And this will be considered code that R won't really execute, right? So like the text here is a simple calculation, it isn't actual code, it is a comment for you. Since we are using RStudio Cloud, what you do want to do at the end of this workshop and uh, we'll mention this at the very end as well. You do want to um, select the uh, R Markdown document on the right-hand panel, click on more, and then go to export and actually save this document to your local computer um, because this RStudio Cloud system uh, is not going to be there forever. So um, if you do use this document to take notes to yourself, um, it is, uh, remember to export it. Um, another option is if you see up by um, Daniel's um, avatar in the right hand corner, their little left of that is something called save a permanent copy. And if you click there, you will have a copy of um, the space for yourself. Ah, yeah, um, that is another way. Um, all right. so. Um, throughout here, because this will end up being rendered into like a nice prettier document um, with uh, screenshots of things, um, there are going to be portions up here that aren't really going to be R code in the sense of um, code that we're going to have R run, but it's going to say something like include graphics, which if you do want to run a piece of R code like one plus two, what you can do is either have your cursor on it or um, press this little play button. If you do, you can select the code that you want and hit control enter, and it will take all of the code that you have selected and run it at the bottom. Right, so there's multiple ways you can um, uh, run these little code blocks. And you can see if I ran this little code block that put in include graphics, it's gonna say like, here's the actual picture and it renders that image um, underneath. So that's the basics around um, just navigating this space. Um, so what we did is um, the format of teaching that we're working with right now is we're trying to give you some, uh, instead of typing everything from scratch, uh, you should be able to have this document with you with most of the stuff filled out. And so 
you can follow along uh, without typing everything manually. And it, in some sense, it will save us a little bit of time. And our main job right now is just to get you exposure, um, that little first hump of the R uh, learning curve. All right, so as uh, most people who work with data, uh, who aren't like, quote unquote, like coming from the data science world, we're probably working in Excel files, right? So we are very, uh, very often are working in Excel because that's, you know, that's the thing we use to look at our data. We can do runoff, one-off calculations in Excel. Like that's usually if you've never programmed in a programming language to work with your data, that's what you're doing. Um, so in R, there is a library called Read Excel. And this is a library that gives us a function to load up Excel files. So if we sort of select this block of code, hit control enter, you'll see on the bottom left-hand side here, it will load the read Excel library. In our current uh, setup that we have right now, there is on, if you go to this files panel, you'll see that there is a data folder and there is an Excel file called smoke underscore complete dot XLSX. And you can see that little portion here of going into the data folder, pointing to the Excel file is right here where I have selected in line 172. And so because we loaded up the read Excel library, we are now given this read underscore Excel function. And if I just select this little portion here and run it, you'll see that it will load up this Excel file um, from our computer. So Try this out on your own Excel files. Um, if you'll notice that if you have an Excel file with different sheets, there is a way to load up a specific sheet. But in R, if you have multiple sheets in an Excel file, you essentially have to load them one at a time. There, it's not like in Excel where you can open up an Excel file and then have all of those sheets available to you at a time, um, all at once. Um, that is part of it as uh, just good data practice, like one file, one data set. Um, there aren't, uh, for at least for this class, there aren't like these big giant batches that um, that you, you that get loaded all together automatically. You have to do it very manually. So you'll see here that if we just run the read Excel file at the bottom, it has printed out a nice pretty version of this Excel file. This is useful. We can load up an Excel file. But as we're working with data, we don't have, we don't want to reload this Excel file every time we want to do a little calculation, right? So if we look at the rest of this line, we're going to create a variable called smoke underscore complete. And then you'll see here this little arrow symbol. And it's a good practice to put a space between both sides uh, because it is literally the less than dash symbol. And you don't want to confuse yourself. Uh, with this dash as being a negative number. Um, in this case, it's pretty obvious that there's no such thing as a negative read Excel call, but um, part of this is uh, good coding practices to put spaces around that arrow. So we're gonna say smoke underscore complete gets this entire read Excel line. So if we click this little play button, one thing you'll notice that it no longer prints out the Excel file that got loaded. But if we look at the top right-hand panel, there is a variable that got created for us called smoke underscore complete. And we got a, a few simple statistics about what's in here. It's telling us that we have 1,152 observations, also known as rows, and 20 variables, so that is 20 columns. So we've looked at, or we, are, we have loaded up this data set. The next thing that we want to do is to just to make sure that this thing got loaded up correctly, right? So there is some text um, underneath about um, how we can do this, um, but there's a couple of ways um, that we can first to explore whether or not our data set was loaded up correctly. There is another function. You might've heard the term tidyverse. Um, Tidyverse refers to a set of packages primarily maintained uh, by our studio, the company. And it's a set of packages um, that all relate with working with data and they all integrate very, very nicely with one another. There is a, within the Tidyverse, there is a package called dplyr or uh, 
that is how you pronounce it, dplyr. Um, so just like how we loaded up the read Excel file, uh, library to load up our Excel files, we can load up the dplyr library to load up just the set of packages related to processing uh, data. You're going to see a bunch of red text here. Not every portion of red text that R gives you is an error. Um, that is something that a lot of newcomers get very confused about. Um, they say like, oh, I got this. Is it an error? Um, that's sort of one of the things I wish R like sort of changed, um, that errors and messages actually don't show up as red because it's not actually a problem. Um, but you'll see down here, it is attaching uh, the uh, dplyr library, and you're going to see some things about uh, functions being that the dplyr library over uh, overwrote, right? But for this class, and for the most part, when you load up dplyr, or if you load up tidyverse, uh, this is pretty common. All right, so we loaded up our Excel file. One of the easiest ways that we can look at how this data set was loaded was if you look at this top right environment panel and you can switch to other panels, but for the most part, we're going to be just clicking on this environment panel. If you click on the word smoke underscore complete, or for me, uh, if this is the first time you're using RStudio, uh, click on the little spreadsheet icon. Do not click this little green arrow uh, that will do something differently. But if you click on any other part of that line, it's going to open up the Excel or spreadsheet view of the data set that you loaded, right? So you can see everything that's in this data set. You can scroll all the way down to the last row um, to see all of your columns, et cetera, et cetera, right? So just because you're using a programming language, our studio does a very good job in sort of, you know, getting you a view that you're sort of used to. And this is a really good thing when you first load up a data set, regardless of what data set you use, and I do this all the time as well, is especially if you are working with a data set that you know, you've never seen before, most of the problems are gonna happen like within the first couple of lines of your data set. So uh, one thing you wanna make sure of is did your columns get loaded in correctly? It's very common that sometimes people take notes in the first couple of rows in an Excel file or in, in any data set, and then now, your column names are gonna be like those rows, uh, those notes. And then the first row of data is gonna be like your actual column names um, and then et cetera, et cetera. So everything will get all messed up. Um, so one of the questions Sorry, Daniel. was- I just wanted to quickly address um, a question that came up in the chat. Um, somebody asked, oh, we don't have to install the package. We can just load the library. And that is true because I, when I set up the RStudio workspace, I installed all the libraries packages that we would need. So you don't have to do that now. Um, when you're doing this in your own space, on your own device, you will have to install packages, but just to keep the friction low, I installed all those things um, ahead of time. So hopefully we'll have to deal with any of that. Yep, and then if you ever, um, so, the actual message in chat, like you actually knew the command to install packages, but if you ever forget our studio in the bottom right hand corner, there's a packages tab and you can click on install and type away. Um, so that's also an option if you don't remember the actual command. All right, so at least in our data set, we can now see that, okay, the first and the most important thing, our column names look correct. They got loaded in correctly. And the first row actually looks like data. Um, and these are things that might happen depending on like if you're working with people who aren't using a programming language to analyze data, there's going to be like weird quirks, um, especially if you're in the Excel world, like you're going to end up with like a random, uh, a bunch of empty columns here and then like a number because someone decided to put an off calculation somewhere or at the very bottom of the data set, you know, there might be like the sum or some average calculation of the entire column. And so those are things that you want to be very mindful of uh, when you load in, especially someone else's Excel file. Right. So uh, make sure that those off calculations that probably happened um, aren't there. And then this is really good for you as somebody who is now trying to use R in part, part of their workflow to 
don't make those uh, one-off calculations. If anything, put them in another sheet so you don't load it up as part of your actual data set. Um, I pasted a link to this wonderful, um, uh, basically this article by Kara Wu and Carl Broman about spreadsheets and good practices for formatting them. It's surprisingly really entertaining, so it's a good guide. Um, yeah, it's it's entertaining because we've all done this and yeah. <laughs> um, they sort of call you out on it. Um, uh, so. And another thing Daniel said about, you know, oftentimes at the beginning of your Excel spreadsheet that you'll see things that are, you know, like comments or stuff like this. But then you also, it's very common in a, a lot of medical data, especially if you're getting outputs from like um, enterprise data warehouse that comes in like an Excel spreadsheet that at like the very end of your document will have like a timestamp and like this document is confidential or something like this. And so you, when you try and load it, you'll start to get errors at the end. So I really recommend what you Ted shared is, is will save you a lot of pain. All right. Um, so another way, instead of just actually clicking on this, um, if you don't, if you're not using our studio for, for some example, or for whatever reason, or if you just want to quickly look at the first couple of values for all of your columns in like a very quick view, dplyr gives you this function called glimpse. And so if we run this block, you'll see that it sort of gives us like a transposed version of the actual spreadsheet. So like flip the rows and columns. And so this is a really good way to get a quick, um, just so you can scroll down and not scroll across for things. Um, it gives you the number of rows, it gives you the number of columns, and it gives you all of the column names. Because we're in the tidyverse world, um, it's also giving us what is the type of data stored in that column. So if you, for example, get something, um, Excel does this a lot where you're, if, if you put in like a, like a number, for example, and all of a sudden turns into a date, you know, like this will actually tell you what did R load this data as, right? So it's also really common uh, for zip codes to be loaded in as an actual number and some zip codes start with the zero and then now you're missing digits in your, in your zip code, right? Um, so this is a good way to sort of start like figuring out what might be wrong with your data set. And so, uh, we don't, I don't think we have that problem here, but these are the types of problems that you might show up. So CHR stands for character, so like actual strings. So you can see here, year smoke is showing up as a character, right? And so we something, you know, later on when we're looking at this data set is like, oh, why did this thing get loaded up as a character? It could be loaded up as a character because there's like NA, the word, like for missing value was showing up in our data set. Or maybe somebody typed in missing, M-I-S-S-I-N-G, and then now that whole column is read in as like characters, right? So you can get a lot of information about which columns might have problems just by looking at how this data set got loaded in. And then not only that, you also got a view of a couple of values of your data set as you're um, going through this. And you can see it's much easier because I can just scroll down instead of going to another tab to like see my data set. So let's take, um, a couple of, uh, let's take a minute. Um, there's three questions down here. And if you want, you can type them into chat, like just say one and then the answer. But using this output, you can start answering these questions. Like how many rows of data do we have in our data? Um, somebody have an answer. Uh, there's multiple ways you can um, uh, go about looking at this, right? So like, yes, there's uh, 1,152 rows in our data. There's a couple ways you can do this. Again, you can look at the environment panel here. Um, you can look at the output of Glimpse. One of the other comments was there's this n row parameter. So um, just like read underscore CSV as a function, there's another function called n row for number of rows. And then yes, there's an n call for number of columns. And if we put in uh, smoke complete, it'll give us the actual value back, right? So all of what's really nice about using a programming language is all of these things that you can visually inspect, you can write code for. And this is really great, um, especially if you're working or trying to get uh, data that has a very specific structure. Like if you're working with county data, there's only some, there's a fixed number of counties like today uh, in any different location. So your data set should have 
X number of rows or X number of columns, one for each county. Um, so the other question is how many columns are there? So uh, what are the some of the column names? Uh, so there's uh, some um, solutions out there. So you can see the number of columns. You can get that information from Glimpse. You can look here um, in the top right corner in the environment panel. And then some of the values, Glimpse also gives this to you. And then if you want, you can click on the actual thing and you'll get the view of your data set. Um, so you can get a sense of uh, what's going on. And then the other column is like, can you tell what type of variable is stored in a column? So there's a couple of ways using glimpse, you'll see it uh, right next to the column. Um, if you are using a function that is coming out of the tidyverse, just typing in the column, uh, the data set itself will give you a small printout that will fit the, um, that will fit the co console. And it will give you the number of rows, number of columns, the column name, and then underneath the actual column type. Um, this doesn't always happen. And this only happens because we're working with a tidyverse um, version of a data frame. Um, and so this data set that got loaded is called a data frame object. And so that's sort of the nice thing with the tidyverse is uh, it sort of allows you to do these quick glances of things like a little bit faster um, instead of typing the code for it. All right, so the next thing is we just loaded up a data set. Um, how do we just get a very, very quick uh, glimpse or a very quick view of like what's going on in here? We've already checked that our data set was loaded in correctly. And so there is another function called skim um, that comes from a library called skim R. So a lot of R libraries just have the letter R in it as a, um, R is a very punny language. And so we can just like loading up all of the other functions, there is a library called skim R and we can skim our data set like to quickly read through our data set. So the skim R package has a function called skim and this is really good if like you don't do anything else with your Excel data analysis, you know, try loading this into R and then running the skim function just to make sure that uh, things are loaded up correctly, your data set is formatted correctly, but it also gives you a lot of uh, statistics for all of your columns, uh, which is something a little bit more complicated to do in Excel. And so if this is all you do, I would con consider that a, a win as well. Uh, one of the questions was, does it cause problems loading in too many libraries? Um, the short answer is no. Uh, there isn't a problem when you load up too many libraries. Um, eventually, uh, when you start developing packages on your own, the name of the functions that you write in your own package will matter. Because if you remember from the very beginning, uh, when we loaded up dplyr, um, I guess like that text isn't there anymore. Um, it said something like this, like the following objects are masked from package stats. Package stats is, uh, there's a stats library that is default in R. And so it has its own filter and lag function. And because we loaded up dplyr, it overwrote the stats filter and lag function. So in some sense, if you work in the tidyverse world, because it's all maintained by our studio and they are very conscious of the stuff that they're building, you don't have to worry about loading too many libraries from the tidyverse world. If you start loading packages from a bunch of random, like quote unquote random people, you might start seeing messages about functions overwriting one another. Um, in that sense, you have to be more mindful, but it's not going to cause a problem. Um, okay, so skimming our data set, um, just like using Glimpse, we get some bit basic information. Here is the data set name. It's called smoke underscore complete. It's got the number of rows, number of columns. It also tells us, you know, how many of our columns are characters, like just regular strings? How many of them are numbers? Um, this is really good because if you do expect all of your data to be a number, like if you're reading in sensor data and it's all just a bunch of numbers, um, if you end up with something that's a character, that might be kind of like what is going on here. Um, a lot of medical data sets will have a data set that is all 
encoded and then a separate code book. So you might have the data set itself is supposed to be all numbers. And so this is one way you can check like, is everything a number without you manually scrolling through everything? There's a section here called group variables. We'll talk about that uh, when uh, Mara talks about dplyr stuff. But down here, the really nice thing, and it's a little bit more difficult to get this type of output in uh, Excel, is for every single column in our data set um, in different portions. So characters are things that are like our strings. Um, it'll give us a couple of uh, descriptive statistics, like how many of these character things are considered missing. Uh, we know that um, just by looking at the glimpse or that quick view of our data set, um, right here, some of the character um, has NA, the string, like the characters N uh, followed by A. So this is usually R sees this as a missing variable, but it's because we see it in quotes, it is not tr being treated as a missing variable. So in some sense, we can see like this small discrepancy between, okay, this is, this is read in as um, a value called NA, not missing value um, that R understands. So we'll see that like, okay, the number of missing, all of these being zero kind of suspect because we know that there's a problem there. The completion rate, so this is out of a, a, a percentage really. So it's saying that we have nothing missing and everything has a value. And then in here we have um, some other sets of um, uh, descriptives. I believe this is min max in terms of like number of characters. So if you see something that's like extremely long, um, probably someone put in a paragraph for like a, for something that's like an other response or something. Yes, and it's extremely suspect to have no missing data um, in medical data. Um, just, just, you know, like if you look at like gender and pregnancy values, like you expect the males not to be pregnant or like an NA value there um, because that doesn't apply, right? So um, a lot of times, especially if you're getting this stuff out in the wild, um, it's very unlikely uh, you have nothing, uh, everything, as completed data. So the next block, um, and let me make this screen a little bit wider so this prints out a little nicer. The next block down here is a different set of summary statistics, and it's different because we have different types of data, right? Because R understood this as a number, when we have numbered values in our data set, we typically look for different things. So we have here age act diagnosis, days to birth, cigarettes per day. Those are usually numbers. We get the same basic things of like, is there a value missing in its completion rate? But because it's a number, uh, we usually want to look at the mean and standard deviation of these things. And so using glimpse is a very great way um, to see, um, stuff that you probably already want to figure out when you load up a data set, right? And so AJAC diagnosis, you'll see that this is uh, 24,000. So probably something to do with a unit there. That's, you know, maybe clearly this isn't year um, as um, the unit. Um, it's the actual, it's age at diagnosis in terms of day. And so if we want to figure out how old they are in number of years, we have to do some kind of calculation. It's really dividing by 365.25, uh, which Mara will show you in a little bit. Um, and we get like um, percentile uh, values. So we have quartile. So what is the lowest value? The 25% quartile, a uh, percentile, the 50% tile 75, 100. And at the very right hand side, we actually get a um, ASCII histogram just to show you um, what is the general distribution of this data set, right? And so you can see for AJAC diagnosis, we know it's skewed to the left. It's, um, I know this data set a little bit, so it's like in the 60s, right? So this data set are mostly like the people between 60 and 80. Um, days. Um, so for example, cigarettes per day, um, just looking at the mean and standard deviation, deviation uh, it's around two cigarettes per day. Um, and so most of this data is going to be squashed 
um, to the left hand side so that's right skewed and that is what skim is allowing um, allowing you to do is very quickly get a view of your data set if we um, if we go back up to our um, read underscore Excel data set. In our studio, if you put the cursor um, between the, uh, right before that opening bracket and you hit the F1 key, the our studio will open up the help pages for your um, function that you have the cursor on. And so, this is here, we're using the read Excel library and we're using the read underscore, underscore Excel function. You can see down here, this read underscore Excel function takes in actually a lot of other ways you can tweak this function. The first thing is path, which is that data set that we loaded. But you can see here, you can say sheet equals, and if you want to load up a different sheet, you can. Um, there is another thing here, so NA, is a empty string, but if we were to say NA is equal to the string NA, we'll now, we now would have fixed that little problem of all of these things that were characters are now actually being properly read in as NA, right? And that's because the um, Excel file itself had NA, the character is being read in, and usually people assume if it's uh, blank, it's missing. And so um, you'll see this a lot in um, health data sets as well, where 99 gets encoded as a missing value. Um, and so that's like missing. I, as the person putting together this data set, understand that this is missing. And it's different from I, as the person, forget to collect that data. Right. So you'll see 99s or 88s um, a lot for like other random codes. Um, you'll other you'll also see um, I believe range is like how you can set like where your data set actually starts. Um, so if you have a whole bunch of um, metadata in the beginning of your Excel sheet or at the end, like if you get data from like the CDC, like the first sheet that gets loaded is just like, here's a terms of use, right? So you're not loading from the first sheet, you're usually loading from a different sheet. And so that's how you can, um, if you, for example, put in a data set into read Excel and all of a sudden there's something wrong with it, you can put your cursor right before the opening uh, parenthesis, hit F1, and then use the parameters here to help you. And if you scroll down a little bit more, you'll see the actual read, um, the actual definition or the of what each of those parameters does, right? So you can specify and read that as well. So here, NA is a character vector of strings to interpret as missing values, right? So if I was loading up um, miss, um, a health data set and I know that in the code book, it says 99s are considered missing. I would also put in 99. And so when that gets loaded into R, it also gets treated in as a missing value, right? And so these are different ways you can modify how the data set gets loaded in. And if you can fix it during load in time, it'll save you a bunch of headache. Uh, so because you don't have to process it manually, you're using uh, this function for you to load in. And so, yeah, I will post this little thing in, oops, um, in the chat, whoops, 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 um, um, for that bit. And so I believe, uh, so do we have any questions? So hopefully this got everyone um, oriented into just loading up your data set into R. Um, and if all you do is take a data set that you have right now and just try loading it in try it, uh, look at it through glimpse and um, skim. If you've never programmed before, I would consider that a win because now you have a very, a little bit more programmatic way to um, spot check your data set um, and you get some kind of descriptive stats out of it. Um, and then you can slowly start picking up um, more R skills um, but getting started is you is usually the hardest part of all of this. Uh, so there's a question from uh, Jason Toppin. So I know you can read use read CSV for Excel files. Is that a good idea? Um, so 
The answer to that is usually no. <laughs> uh, so I believe, okay, so if you do use a function that's like read underscore CSV, it's gonna treat, it's gonna assume that one, it's a plain text file and it's delimited by a comma. CSV stands for comma separated values, right? So Excel files one are technically aren't really plain text. It's, you can open it up as a plain text thing, but it's really not. Um, and so if you try to read an Excel file using read underscore CSV, it's probably going to error out. I'm going to say that like the other side is usually okay. Like Excel will open up a CSV file and you can use like the text to columns feature or most of the time Excel understands that it's a CSV file and it'll open up. But usually the, the other way doesn't work. Um, if you do end up opening a what you think is an Excel file with read underscore CSV, I almost certain that they just changed the extension on you. Uh, and so you didn't really get an uh, Excel file to begin with. Just one quick thing to mention is if you do want to use read CSV, you can convert the Excel file. You can see within Excel, you can save it as a CSV file and then use read CSV to read that new version of the file. Yeah, and one other thing um, before we take, we sort of switch to the next section. If you ever forget what, how to load up a data set, for example, in the environment panel, there is this portion here that says import data set. It's different from the import data set like up here somewhere that I know exists, but I never use. But this portion, there's part that says import data set. So if you have a SPSS, SAS, data, data set, Excel, um, if you forget the function or you don't know the function to use, you can use this system as well. So we can say from Excel, it'll give us a nice little pop-up and then you can actually browse to your Excel uh, data set, right? So we have data, Excel, and it will give us a preview of what it will load. And so this is useful because if you have multiple sheets, you don't have to rely on your you typing it. You'll notice that right here, it's going to write the code for you on the side. And so if you have a range like, okay, Excel sheet from like, let's say I want A1 to, I don't know, D, D5. Um, you can do little subsets of your data set right here and you'll see that it's going to write the code for you. And so what you can do is copy this block of code. You can also hit import as well. Um, and it will do that for you. Um, and then you can simply paste this into R and you have that code block for you. So that, that works for a bunch of other things as well. Um, so don't feel like you have to memorize every single function um, that we're showing you. Um, there's a lot of ways to get help, especially from just getting your data set into R. And that little import function is really useful. Um, and hitting F1 um, is also really useful. Um, all right. Okay. Um, we are getting close to the top of the hour. Um, so uh, I think this would be a good time for a quick bio break. Uh, I'm gonna, uh, Ted, Daniel, do you have anything quick to say before people go and then we can restart in five minutes? Uh, no, we'll take about five minutes. Um, if you have like weird setup issues, just plop them into the Zoom chat um, and we can either help you set things up right now, but if there's a more general question, we'll answer it when we come back. Okay, so a question came up in the chat during the break about um, how do you get data, for example, from GitHub or other sources into RR Studio? And there are tons of different ways um, to do it. You can do old fashioned ways where you're downloading into your um, files and then reading it in. But then there's also a whole suite of different functions that can pull data in if you feed it like a URL. Um, there's a package I like to use called Google Sheets 4 that um, pull stuff in from a um, Google Sheet that I have. Um, so there's lots of different ways. You don't have to have everything locally stored uh, on your device. Yeah. 
Um, okay. Okay. And, uh, Ted. Yes. So um, before we kind of get into the plotting, I just want to again, you know, it's all about kind of words of wisdom. Uh, can everyone see my screen, by the way? Sorry, I need. I'm just trying to get to this. Yeah, I can see it, Ted. Okay, great. Um, so I'll send the link out to these. These are. This is just um, some slides about errors and debugging. Um, that again, you know, we want to encourage you to like, you know, keep on trying. So number one thing is, you know, learning R is not easy. So kudos to all of you for, you know, wanting to do this. So again, like the, the key is really what to learning more and to finding out like the source of errors is to not beat yourself up. Um, the, the, num the number two rule is like use Google and don't feel bad about it. <laughs> because um, we all use Google, because sometimes there is just like a very obscure error. And like, you know, I will often cut and paste that error into Google and see if I can find an appropriate help. But this is just a cute, another cute um, uh, drawing from Allison Horst that just, you know, talks about kind of the, the debugging process. So sometimes you really, you really got that, you think you got this, um, but it is, you know, there's all of these other kind of, again, it's kind of like that roller coaster of kind of going up and down. Um, just want to talk, Daniel covered this a little bit, but I just want to talk a little bit about understanding the difference between warnings and errors. So oftentimes, like what Daniel was showing you, uh, you, you get a warning. And a warning is just an indication that the data or arguments aren't quite what the function expected. So oftentimes you can run the code, but you should definitely verify the output of the code. So the difference between a warning and an error is that the error means that a code can't execute at all, given what you've, you've, you've kind of put into the function. So this kind of gets into why these can be very difficult to understand. So Googling is standard practice for errors. So again, um, you know, if we're, if we, I know most of you are clinicians, so we can talk about levels of evidence, right? So there is kind of an order, there's an order of levels of evidence in terms of Googling as well. Um, a lot of the times, this is kind of the order that I look in. So I go in, in terms of our studio community, if I have a tidyverse question, they are great. Um, I could usually search like the search the forums there and I can usually find an answer. Um, Stack Overflow um, is also good. That's kind of my second second line of Googling. Um, so this is a website that has a lot. It's basically a knowledge base. When people encounter errors, they ask questions about it and hopefully someone has answered it. Um, so that's also a great resource. Um, so if you are doing bioinformatics, another great source is BioStars. Um, and then kind of the, the last thing I check is the packages GitHub page. So, um, you know, the, R Street, the Tidyverse has great documentation. And, you know, if something changed in one version to another, like that's where I can find out about it. Um, just, you know, just a plug for social coding. I think one of the hardest things, like when you're starting out, is like being vulnerable and working with other people. But I will say that it will improve your code a lot. So we all have blind spots. And, you know, if you're working with someone else, you know, they don't have that kind of that kind of goggle, those kind of, you know, code goggles that you might have. So they can usually find something that's like a misplaced parentheses or bracket for misspellings. Um, and then the last thing is usually the error you're looking for is at the bottom. So there's usually be a bunch of errors generated, but the one you're interested in is usually the one at the bottom, the last one. Um, and I think that's all, all I have. <laughs> so I will stop sharing and take it away, Mara. Okay, um, thanks so much, uh, Ted. Um, so, I am going to share my screen. Okay. Um, can
can I get uh, a verbal cue that I that you guys can see my screen? Yep. Um, uh, so we're going to start with the looking at um, doing some plotting. Um, and I just want to draw your attention to a handy little feature um, that I didn't know about for a long time when I was using our studio. If you see down here where my um, cursor is, um, there's this little box down here. And if you click on it, um, it has, our studio is interpreting different lines of your code um, to like provide you a table of contents um, so that you can um, pop around more easily. Um, Cause sometimes with these very large documents, um, you are, um, you are uh, really seeing quite, a, it's just so too difficult to scroll through everything. So um, I'd like everybody to uh, come down to part two, the plotting our data. Um, so we're gonna take that data that we loaded with um, Daniel and we're gonna make some plots. Um, so the first thing we're gonna do is just produce a histogram from that smoke complete um, using um, something called geom histogram. And what I wanna emphasize is we're just going to make some plots right now. And then we're gonna talk about um, the underlying structure of like where these plots are coming from. Um, so looking down in this code chunk right here, um, I want you to find, um, and we're gonna define all these terms, but I want you to go and put the cigarettes per day variable. That's the column name we have in our in our data set. And I want you to put that into this underscore um, area, completely replacing this. This is not valid code. It's just a place marker that where we want you to put in that cigarettes per day. And then once you've done that, I want you to um, uh, hit that run the current chunk chunk um, and see what you get. And then um, I cannot see the thumbs up right now, but if people could give thumbs up if they're having success with this and somebody give me some verbal feedback. Um, oh, I guess I might be able to see it in the chat. Okay, yes, great. I'm seeing some thumbs up um, and I'm seeing a no. Okay, so uh, give it just a few more seconds and then I'm gonna show you um, my, uh, my um, answer to it. Okay, so I'm gonna go in here and I'm gonna assign um, cigarettes per day um, to that X. And then I'm gonna run this chunk right here. Okay. One of the questions that came up was why didn't the plot go to plots? Um, could you just make sure you describe that? I mean, it's because it's in the RMD um, file and it's previewing it for you in there instead of in the plots. Correct, correct. Um, a lot of people, um, it, and it's hard for me to say this necessarily um, or describe this because I didn't know what like a code script was for like the first six months I was learning um, R. Like the only way I ever interacted with R was in RMD files. And so I was very used to this kind of like I type in my code in a code chunk and then I see the outcome of it. When you're interacting more with the script or in the console, you're gonna um, see a lot more things like being sent to like the plots um, package, or I'm sorry, tab, and instead of being plotted out over here. Okay. Um, okay, going on to the next 
staff, unless, if, of course, keep putting your questions, great, um, uh, in the chat. Um, so we're looking at this plot right now, but there's a few issues with it. Um, I'm actually gonna try and make this, I made it big to, um, make it easy to see, but it's almost too big. So there's a few issues. Um, the, the cigarettes, the titles aren't like, I mean, they're fine, but they're not super pretty. Um, and uh, there's no title. Um, so let's try and make our um, graph a little bit more um, descriptive. And so we're gonna work on just um, putting some titles into different things. And then also we're gonna introduce something called um, a themes um, function uh, and see the outcome. So uh, I want you all to go down to the, the choke code chunk called um, beautify plot two. And I want you to put in um, any title you want uh, for the, the title um in this this labs function here and then you can decide what you want to call your x-axis title and your y-axis title here and then i want you to take um a uh, theme classic and plop it into um this bottom underscore there so i'll give folks a minute here otherwise i'll just um uh I'm, I'm pretty impatient um, and so it feels like when you're teaching sometimes uh, you think you've waited five minutes but it's been about five seconds and definitely in the um, give a thumbs up if people are getting it or I know if you're not in the reactions And once you've put in all those things, go ahead and um, uh, run that chunk again. Okay. You about twenty more seconds, and then I'll. Um, put it in with what I had. Okay. Okay, so I'm just gonna say, this is a great title. Fantastic. X axis title. And I'm just going to run it then. And so you're seeing here where I put my title, I'm getting a title up here, I'm getting my y-axis title over here, uh, and a really nice, fantastic um, x-axis title. And just looking back, we haven't changed anything about how we're um, displaying the histogram data itself. It's just like other components um, of the plot. Um, so you can hear, see here with this theme classic, um, it's a lot more white space. And so there's all sorts of built-in custom themes. And you can also even create your own themes that your organization, um, you know, like the Economist uses are, I believe, and they have their own um, uh, package. And there's different universities that have it to all their, their fonts and colors and everything like that. So um, going on, um, you're gonna see, uh, um, a message, not an error, a message um, of the code that says 
stat bin using bins equals 30. Um, and so you'll see that here if you click this red text again, which is not an error, it's just a message. I think Daniel and Ted have both talked about that. Um, and Ted or Daniel, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure like, I can't remember where this comes from, if this is just the default or if it's something about the data that the ggplot. Um, it, it, is, it is the date, it's the default, yeah. which I'm not a big fan of, to be yeah. honest, but um, <laughs> that's what it, that's what it does, so. <laughs> yep. Um, uh, so, you know, this for meaning that, um, So we want to play around with that a little bit to, to get a different number of bins, meaning sometimes it's easy to get confused because sometimes people refer to bin width, which is like how many values are captured in each uh, bar of the histogram, and then the bins, um, which is like the number of columns that you could potentially have here. Um, so let us um, decide that we want uh, our bins to be something else in width. Um, so in here under this and this underscore, um, go ahead and put in two there and, and then run your code chunk and see what it looks like. Um, and while everybody's doing that, um, I'll just make a note about um, the, See if you'll see this uh, red little circle with an X through it. And this is the RStudio um, uh, interface telling you that it feels like something is incorrect um, right there. And so it, it's kind of guiding you to where you might need to make uh, changes. So are people having success with that? I'm going to put in two there and run the code. And then how easy it is to, to be able to interact with your data and very quickly um, change your plot um, without, uh, without all the difficulties that creating plots in something like Excel it might feel like, um, oh, I have a lot of control over things, but it ends up becoming a very manual process. And so one of the great things about creating plots um, uh, in R and with ggplot is that you can really make um, complicated things very quickly reusing code, or you can make big changes with just tiny tweaks of the code. Yeah. Uh, just as a quick note, like, so um, we're we are publishing a paper and I did, I generated all of the plots using ggplot code and we basically had our students do all of the customization. So our collaborators wanted all of these things fixed. So I was able to give my students the ggplot code and they were just able to easily modify it and format it as like our collaborators wanted for our figures, um, which is not trivial when you are doing it for 24 figures. So. <laughs> not at all, not at all. Um, and so let's, uh, one more thing we're gonna do here um, before we get into under pulling the um, curtain back a little bit on uh, ggplot to, to understand what's going on. Um, for here, uh, I want you to put um, the variable gender down in this um, facet grid area and then run the code. We'll spend about 30 seconds on that. Oh, great. That's a great question. Um, uh, what is the first line of the code chunk mean? Uh, so the curly brackets um, and then R means tells the um, uh, 
computer that we're running a code chunk in R. Um, we're not going to talk about it here, but there are other options um, in R Studio that you might be running different codes. Uh, I'm sorry, different programming languages. So you can run, you can use Python or SQL, um, Bash um, in here. Um, and so that's just a, a way, yeah, yeah, it's, it's just the, the denotation that this we're using R. Then when it says facet right now, um, that is me giving a name to the code chunk. Um, and so uh, there's some minor, not super important things right now, but um, you for when you name it, um, that's what creates this code chunk um, name down here. So you can easily jump around. Otherwise it just gets a generic um, chunk 17 and wouldn't have a name right here. Um, I recently learned that I shouldn't be using underscores in them. Um, I should use dashes if you're going to be like cross-referencing uh, different things. So if you're writing a paper all in R um, and you want to be like refer to a figure or a plot, there's this wonderful other packages where you can just say like, um, refer to facet and it will like auto label whatever figure that is and things like that. So really fancy options. Okay. And so we're gonna put gender down in here and run that. Um, and so you're gonna see here that we have now faceted our plot, pulling out the data for females and males in our um, data with two plots next to each other, all the females, all the males. Um, and this is possible for any number or you know, any variable, that would be a reasonable thing to do to understand the differences um, in different groups. Um, and I'm, you, you've probably seen this a ton in different um, uh, uh, journal articles or things like this, um, really, uh, once you've seen ggplot, you'll start seeing it everywhere in uh, uh, articles, scientific articles. Okay, um, it is almost 4.30 right now, and we're going to go on to um, ggplot2, um, talking just about the fundamentals of this package. Um, I know Ted has to head out in a little bit, so I was just wondering if anybody wants to, uh, any of the instructors or TAs want to mention anything um, before we start in on the, the next section. No, um, unfortunately, we had a scheduling snafu, so I do have to drop off. I will be back in an hour. So um, anyways, it was good to see all of you, and I will see you later. Bye, Ted. Thanks. I have something quick to, to add. Um, one, another way besides at the bottom of your um, screen to jump to code is you can use the little lines up near the blue eye. Um, would, Mara, would you be willing to show where that is? Yeah, you can, oh, the, the little line's right next to the line. Oh, the yeah. table of contact. I heard yeah, eye, so, and I was oh, like, yeah. I guess well, it looks look like an eye. It. Yeah, so if you click on that, that's another way to jump to anywhere in your code. Yeah, and then um, a really nice, thank you so much. Was that Molly? I It's hard for me to see. Um, I, I apologize if it's not Molly who said that. But another nice thing in that when you're in the R Studio IDE, is that um, an IEDE just stands for Integrated Development Environment? I can't remember. Daniel. Yes, that's right. Yeah, and that's just a fancy word of saying it's like the graphical interface of interacting with everything. Um, it often, if you hover over things, it will tell you like what it does and also the code shortcut for things. Um, and I must admit, I'm like not. I was not a big like keyboard shortcut person until I started coding a lot and like my life is so much better. <laughs> um, and I, uh, if you uh, do a Google search for just like uh, ggplot cheat sheets or RStudio cheat sheets, um, RStudio puts out a, a big collection of cheat sheets for very popular or big packages. Um, that I use all the time. And I actually think a whole bunch of them just got a huge um, facelift um, this summer. And, and they're super useful um, when you're 
after you've gotten a little bit familiar with the package um, to, to jog your memory about stuff. Okay, so going on, uh, now that we've made a couple of the plots, I want to talk a little just bit about um, uh, what ggplot stands for. And so um, ggplot is a library, it's actually called ggplot2, um, is, the, is the package name. And the GG stands for um, a grammar of graphics. And why this is so important is it's really breaking down graphics into very specific um, components, constituents, to make it easy to create graphics, to create graphics that can be um, understood across packages. Um, and this is just an amazing uh, improvement on things before where everybody kind of had their like own package that did some graphic stuff, but wasn't compatible with other graphics. So while ggplot2 is a, is a great package, there's tons of other packages um, that build onto ggplot2 and compatible with ggplot2 to make all sorts of different um, uh, uh, things using this consistent way of describing things. Um, and so looking down at this graphic um, here, sorry, it's a little hard for me to read up here and look down at the graphic. We're going to talk about some of these different specific parts of graphics and learn a little bit more about how to make them. Um, and then just as a note, there's a lot of different ways that you could write um, R code or GG um, plot code. Um, there's some sort of like for, very formal ways and some more casual ways. Um, and we're gonna focus a little bit more on the formal style just because it's, it's we expect a lot of you this is the first time or you haven't seen it very often. Um, so it's a little bit more wordy than it, you have to be, but just to try and be very clear about um, what, what is going on. But as you um, become more familiar, you're gonna start um, uh, um, uh, shortening it up. And yeah, Daniel just made a good point in the chat. Um, ggplot2 is the, is the name of the package and the library that we have loaded. And ggplot um, that you've seen here um, is the function um, that uh, starts making the graphical uh, object. Okay, um, so uh, we're going to break this big, big chunk of code down to understand the component parts, um, and then we're going to um, build on from that. So this is a full example um, with tons of these comments that you might remember um, Daniel talking about that um, this hash and then this text after it that is marked out as green. These are comments that are not code, they're not run as code, but they're there um, to help guide you um, if you're leaving notes to yourself, future you or other people who are um, using your code. Um, and so right here, uh, the very first part of our function, ggplot, is that we have, we're telling the function, I have data. That data is called smoke complete. You know, that's um, still loaded up over here that we did that earlier, created that object from our Excel spreadsheet. Um, and then I'm telling ggplot, I want you to do this mapping. In my data, look at column age at diagnosis and assign that to the x-axis. Then um, I want you to take um, cigarettes per day and assign that to the y-axis. I also want you to take the variable disease, it's another column we have, and base the color on the, of the plot on that. Um, and then I'm telling it, now that I've told you how to map this data, I want you to make um, a geom point, meaning um, a lot of people, I think a word that's more familiar is like a scatter plot um, for this. Um, 
And that is then taking the mapping and adding what's called the geometry. The alpha is not very important, but we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, something that we're familiar with that we did up in the prior exercises is we were giving um, the, the titles um, of the plot, of the x-axis, of the y. Here, I'm saying that um, my legend for color is disease type. Um, and then remember how we faceted it. And so we're going to facet it based on gender. And then we're going to give it this theme. OK, so go ahead and run that code chunk. Um, I don't think anybody, um, you wouldn't have had to do anything for the code there. But we're going to now walk through step by step of creating this plot um, uh, to see how each of those steps builds up um, into the final plot. Any questions at this point? Oh, yes, great point, Daniel. Um, it's easy to miss, but you'll see this little plus sign. Um, it's just a little bit more cluttered here because of all the comments that I put in afterwards. Um, but this is how we link different parts of our um, arguments together to get to the final thing. It'll be a little bit clearer down here um, as we step through. So. Uh, yeah, chaining everything together with that plus sign. And that, Daniel, jump in, please, too. I feel like that's a very GG plot thing. Like, I don't really see that in a lot of different other. Um, so that plus thing is part of how R interprets the code. When it mm -hmm. sees the plus, it knows to look on the next line. So it's the same thing as doing like three oh, plus that's... two. Yeah, yeah, totally, totally. Um, uh, uh, yeah, that's true. Because like, if you're if you're typing in the console and you do like one plus, the console spits back at you like plus what? It's expecting more um, more code. Okay, great. So now we're gonna start in that process of um, uh, rebuilding that prior plot. So. First step for, um, uh, I want you to put smoke complete um, in that space to, um, to tell ggplot that the data is that smoke complete object. So as soon as you do that, um, run the code chunk uh, and give a thumbs up if you don't get an error. I'm throwing it in there. And you're getting this kind of a boring output null. Well, there's no graph there um, because we haven't told, we've kind of just like initiated a, a plot, like getting ready to make a plot. Because we haven't told um, ggplot like what goes to x, what goes to y, how we want that plotted, or anything like that. Um, and so I saw in the chat um, that, uh, you know, what is um, aesthetics? Um, I don't want to belabor things too much, but just think of it as um, how you want things to look on the graph, on the plot, basically telling it map this variable to this characteristic. So I want something to go to the X, I want something to go to the Y, and I want something to go to color. So um, what I want you guys all, what I want y'all to do is um, uh, assign age at diagnosis to the X variable right here. Cigarettes per day to the Y variable right here. Um, and then um, disease to color. And then once you've done that, I want you to run the code chunk. And then if folks wouldn't mind giving thumbs up um, as they're getting there, um, so I can use that nonverbal or that uh, nonverbal feedback to kind of pace.
Oh, I love all these new different reactions. Okay, I'm going to start filling in. Yeah, that, that's a really nice way to, to think of it as um, uh, when you start assigning your data, it's like, yeah, getting your graph paper out to start everything. So I'm going to run this code chunk. Um, okay, so I have something now, uh, but I don't see my data, and that's because I haven't told um, ggplot how I want um, that data to be plotted in a sense. So imagine maybe I want a line graph or I want a bar chart. Um, I might have given. Uh, ggplot function, the names of the variables they want, but I haven't told it how to lay it all out yet. So in our next step here, we're going to add um, to the squiggly spot right here, or to the underscore spot, um, the geom point. And then uh, road, run that code chunk. And when you're, um, uh, you see that output, give me some thumbs up or checks. I haven't seen any thumbs up yet, so I'm just going to give it a few more seconds for folks. Okay, there. Okay, everybody's giving the thumbs up now. Um, great. Somebody asked a really nice question. Um, why do we not have to fill in the anything in the parentheses of the geom point? Um. That is because uh, ggplot has a algorithm of how it interprets things. And so unless you specify something in this area, things from the prior um, uh, lines get inherited um, to the next argument or next function here. So even though like I have assigned color here to disease, maybe for some reason, I actually don't really care about um, disease. I don't want my data to be differentiated by color um, at that point. Um, so I could say, oh gosh, this is gonna be embarrassing. I don't know if I know any hex codes, but maybe I can just, um, yeah, <laughs> Woof. live coding, guys. Um, that you can see here. Previously, I told it, tell me color things by disease. And I think there's three different diseases. Um, but then in the next line of code, um, I'm saying, ah, forget about that. I just want everything red. Um, and so it, it ignored the prior layer because I specified something else. But if I got rid of that, then it goes back to how I anticipated or how it was previously. Okay, so this graph is looking really great. Um, I just want, um, yes, that's a good answer, Molly. That, yeah, the, the ggplot doesn't want us to have to say things again and again. It's just, it, it fills in the blanks in um, how it thinks it should. Um, so looking at this plot right here, I want you to go back and look at that full example plot and see if you notice something different um, other than the faceting, obviously the faceting jumps out at you. Um, and then if people notice something that's different, throw it in the chat, I'm curious. Um, if it's noticeable.
Yeah, great. So here you can see that um, kind of we're running into some overplotting issues because of how our points are and how many data points we have. We have everything kind of like pasted all over each other. So it's actually kind of hard to see um, what's going on here. Um, and this could actually be very dangerous in some data visualizations if somebody's like, oh my gosh, look at all these um, blue points in this area or something. But it can just be that like that layer was laid down on top of the red. So it's harder to see the red than it is to see um, the blue. Um, and so we're going to play around with something that um, can help. It's not a total solution at all. Um, but we're going to um, specify the alpha argument. And what the alpha argument is, is the opacity of the point. And so it's a very from, it's a value from zero to one. Um, so I want you to try a few different um, values in this space right here from zero to one. Um, I believe if you put something out of that range, it's just going to give you an error. Um, and then once you've done that, give me a thumbs up. Great, we're getting fast here. Okay, so I'm gonna try an alpha value of 0 0.2 and you can see that things are um, uh, less opaque, um, but you can still see that there's this problem where it looks like the, the red data had been laid down first and then the blue on top of it. So we're obscuring some of it. Um, and then uh, you can get even fainter. <laughs> um, great. And so now uh, I'd like people to um, try to put on some uh, informative labels to our graph. Um, and a big thing to note here is um, if I run this right here, I'm actually getting those underscores here because this is just um, interpreting this as a, as a string of that I want to call my plot so many underscores. Um, and if I tried to not put in uh, quotations, the quotations are telling it that that's a string, um, that R is then the R studio is like saying, whoa, 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 that's not what something I expected there to be. And, and is like warning you of like a pre error. Um, well, we're here, there's like, when you're in this situation of building lots and lots of plots, um, there's this really nice feature where, let's say I know I want all my plots to be called something. And I want to reuse that title over and over again, or I want to reuse that x axis um, uh, um, title. Now that I've assigned these to an object, I can actually um, plop them down here and it, it's gonna use them as well. So, uh, thumbs up if people were able to get titles as, as they expected. Perfect. Okay. <sighs> Okay, great. So as we've been going through, you've been seeing that we've been just like rewriting everything. 
But let's say you just want, you know how you want things to be mapped, you know how you're alpha, but like you're playing around with a few other things. If you assign that to a very, or a new object, I called it plot underscore phi, then you have that object in your environment over here. And you can just continue to build on to it and modify it. So you can totally imagine that maybe you want in your paper, you want this plot somewhere, but then later on, you're gonna uh, um, pull out um, male and female um, and you want that faceted graph. Well, you don't have to rewrite all of this code. You can actually just like put in that extra line of facet grid um, and you will be able to reuse all of that work and that that's a little bit of what Ted was probably talking about is once you've written these things modifying them just becomes a lot easier um, in math. Okay so I want folks to um, in this uh, underscore here um, put in uh, the variable gender in there and then run the code chunk. And then throw those thumbs up uh, if people are having success. <laughs> I don't know if those were some tears I saw or, or hopefully just a, a miss, uh, uh, miss uh, press there. Um, great. Okay, so I'm gonna throw this in here. And run it. Uh, and so now we have faceted things. And um, you can see how the what's up here is is perpetuating down here still. Okay, great. Um, now we're gonna play around with themes and then we're gonna take a um, a, a break. Um, or, yeah, so I want you to take some of these different themes and plop them on to your plot five to see how things look um, differently. You can vote for what your what's your favorite look in the, in the chat. Ooh, I, I see I have an extra parenthesis there. I don't know if that was in your guys' document as well, but make sure you delete that. Um, so I'm going to pick theme dark and theme void, and we'll see what those look like. So there's the theme dark. Here's theme void that kind of just like takes everything away. Theme Excel. Oh, yeah. I actually um, had that in the GG themes, Daniel, but it, <laughs> I had something break and so I stopped. Um, so you can see there's like a lot of themes that are like out of the box for GG plot too. You can make a theme, as I mentioned, you can use other people's, um, your organization might have a theme that you can use. A lot of um, uh, like journals and newspapers or news organizations will have a theme or people like that theme and then they'll they'll make a similar theme. So there's a lovely package called um, uh, GG themes, um, which, you know, that GG is indicating that it's a compatible, um, you know, in the theme or in the, the style, that grammar of graphics as GG plot two. Um, and so you can see these, um, uh, plots made in different styles. And so if, if you've ever seen The Economist, you'll notice this distinct um, light blue, um, the Wall Street Journal uh, style, which I guess I just haven't looked at a physical newspaper in a long time. Um, and then uh, the Tuffy style as well. Okay, it is definitely time for a break. Um, so we'll start up again at uh, 
five o'clock. Um, I'm going to stop recording right now. Pause. Um, welcome back from the break, everybody. Um, I'm going to be going on to our next part of the workshop um, for wrangling data. Um, before I start sharing my uh, screen, um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about some of like the fundamental reason of why you want to use R um, for a lot of this work in medical data. And there are a lot of things you can do with other software. Like you can do a lot of stuff in Excel, um, but the reproducibility and to, to be able to redo your analysis um, is just outstanding. Um, whereas if you're doing things in Excel, you can easily forget that you did something. I'm working on a data set right now of 150,000 different clinical notes that have both like raw text and then um, structured data. And if I miscode something um, in that mapping and find it, like, great, I can, I have that raw data and I can just rerun my entire cleaning and analysis and graphs from it um, without having to do any like horrible manual digging to find the problem. Um, so if you're, if you're still struggling with like, why does it matter? Why do I need to do this? Like, please reach out. I'm so happy to talk and tell you about like all the different horror stories I have seen and why this is like the way to go if you're doing, doing research, um, in, in the medical field. Okay. I'm going to start sharing screen again. Okay, um, so one of the issues is that like, we gave you this like, beautiful data set, set, the smoke complete, and it's like, it looks really nice. Um, but rarely is that the case, right? You, you'll get um, data and it's all sorts of like, maybe there's a hundred columns and you need three of those columns. Maybe it's, um, uh, a million rows and you only care about, you know, patients between the ages of two and two years and four years. And so that would be a, a, a very small chunk of that. Um, so we're gonna talk a little bit about the different ways you might process um, data that you're going to get. Um, and just as a quick aside, there's a lot of different ways um, to manipulate and wrangle data. Um, and what I'm going to be showing here is a lot of the tidyverse. It's a whole ecosystem of R packages that are organized around this um, idea of tidy data. And if one of the TAs or Daniel could maybe find that wonderful paper from Hadley Wickham on tidy data and put it in the chat, I would much appreciate that. Um, that was actually what got me into um, learning how to program was having these issues all the time where I was trying to like deal with data that just wasn't organized in a way that lent itself to analysis. And so when I started to understand the concepts of tidying my data, it like brought together a lot of different things that like I should think about how I collect data um, so that I have my analysis in mind of like what I want to do. We don't always have that convenience, right? Sometimes it's just the data um, that you're given and you have to work with it. But if you're in the, the position of where you're thinking about, I want to do this data or collect this data, I want to do this project, you can think about what that shape that data will look in and how you're going to do your analysis on it um, later, which I think is a great mental exercise in planning your project and really thinking about the kind of analysis and your kind of collection. Okay, um, so we're gonna select um, just a subset of uh, columns from the smoke complete data set. Um, so if you guys could um, look in here, oh gosh, can you guys share my or see my screen? I just don't see the normal. Um, the green ring to make sure I'm sharing the right thing. 
Yes, I can see. Okay, you. good. <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, I want you to take um, the variable names um, gender and days to death and put those into the underscore places and then um, run that. And then start to throw those uh, um, thumbs up uh, when you're successful in that. So I'm gonna do that. And order does matter. Um, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, but uh, so I said, I'm telling uh, R, uh, I want you to use the function select on the data that's called smoke complete. And I want you to take columns um, called gender and days to death, and I want you to show me them. So there we go. Oops. How did that? Oh, interesting. There you go. Um, the, to the, these are the columns that I, that I want there. Um, and then this next thing we're going to show you is called introducing the pipe. And so I'm going to show you this a different way to write this um, that gives you the same um, end product, but it allows you um, to string together chains of functions to really put an advanced wrangling. Um, you know, many steps together. Um, and there's some like speed and um, memory issues that come up as well, but that aren't important here. Um, so I want you to run this chunk of code. There shouldn't be anything you have to add. So we run that. Um, and you're gonna see that it looks the same. And so, what the pipe is, it's from this package that I never say out loud because I can never say it correctly. Daniel, do you want to jump in and say it correctly? Um, sure. Magritter. Yeah, I, 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 <laughs> there's, we mentioned that R is like a putty language, but like, uh, yeah. Um, the, this package, which we loaded earlier, says that this symbol does this special thing where we give it data. And then this is functionally saying like, and then of that data, select gender and um, days to death columns. And so it does that. But then you could string on more and more um, uh, functions and get ever more complicated um, results. So select is picking columns. Um, and now we're gonna meet filter. So stepping back, I mentioned, you know, like, why are we using this? Wrangling that data. Imagine you've gotten um, uh, a data with, you know, 100, 100 columns um, uh, that, uh, and you only want two of them. And so we use select to get the columns that we want. Filter is um, filtering your data um, condition on some condition. Um, so here I'm taking filter and I'm saying, I want you, the data is the smoke complete data. And I want you to look at the column um, BCR patient barcode. And if that inside um, the cell, you know, like, uh, let me show this the uh, object we have here. Of course, it must be really. So what we're saying is if the value in this cell um, is equal to something, I want you to return those rows where that condition is true. OK? Um, and so you can imagine this for all sorts of things. So this is just 
seems like a single person's label when we're getting those back. But you can imagine any sort of um, condition where like, I want everybody who days to death is um, less than 200 or greater than a thousand. Um, and you can do many different things. Like let's say you only want um, people with this stage tumor who have lived um, more than so many days. So, so there's lots of complexity that you can add there. And then the pipe alternate way um, of doing that is that you take your data and say, and then you're piping. And so you're telling R like, here, here's my data. And then I want you to take filter and filter that column on being equal to that. Um, and we're getting the same, um, same, same information back. Um, I'm going to pause there because like that might seem simple, um, but honestly, select and filter are a huge, huge workhorses of data wrangling. Um, and when you're first meeting them, it can sometimes be hard to remember what is select do versus filter. And then filter um, admittedly has kind of like some ambiguity. Am I filtering in or am I filtering out? Um, and so I, I usually think of it as like, you know, keeping the rows that meet this condition. Daniel, any, any thoughts? Yeah, that's about right. Like you can read it as like smoke complete, then filter the rows such that BCR patient barcode is equal to TCJ 18, whatever. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so now um, we introduced the pipe uh, a little bit earlier and you might think like, well, why is it important if I have the other select function, why would I need to use the pipe? Um, and it saves you a lot in these like intermediate steps that like, let's say you have that huge, you know, um, uh, file of a hundred rows and 30,000, uh, I'm sorry, a hundred columns of 30,000 rows. Um, you might not want to keep making different intermediate copies of everything. Um, you don't want to like select and then filter. Um, you just want to do it all in one step. So that's what we're going to do here is we're saying, okay, smoke complete is our data. And then I want to filter um, and to only return rows where the condition of year of birth is equal to or less than 1960. And then I want to select age at diagnosis and gender. So to return just those two columns. Okay. Um, so that's the, the scene that's chaining of multiple functions on, on some data. Um, we're going to shift a little bit um, into talking about a function called mutate. So I really encourage you right now, if you have questions about filter or mutate, or I'm sorry, filter or select, um, to put those in the chat right now. OK. So um, the next function um, I'm going to talk about is called mutate. Um, and I think this came up earlier when Daniel was talking about, uh, when we were looking at the glimpse or the skim of age at diagnosis, and it's this huge number, like it's 24,000 or something like that. I mean, I just like, that's not how my brain works of thinking about how old old somebody is. Um, when I was in residency and in the NICU, yeah, we totally, um, you know, this is a 14 day old infant or, um, but uh, I, I think once you're getting out of the month phase, you're, you're uh, it's, it's not a great way to keep, 
keep the age of somebody um, for easy readability. Um, so let's say we want to make a table um, and we want to uh, have age at, di at diagnosis, but in years. So we're going to use the mutate function to create a new column in our data. Um, and then we're also uh, going to round that new column to give us um, years that look friendly to human readable, you know, not um, a million uh, different or 15 decimal places. Um, so let's select or run that code chunk and see, we're gonna walk through this. So I'm creating a new table and assigning it. And so I say, I want you to take the smoke complete data and then I want you to mutate. And the first argument that goes here into mutate is the name of that new column that you're creating. And so in this case, it's age at diagnosis years. And I'm like trying to give a friendly um, column name so that it's easy to know what's there. And so what that is equal to is age at diagnosis, which we currently have, um, it, which is it stored as days. And then we're gonna divide it um, by 365.25 days, so the number of days in a year, um, to get back uh, a diagnosis in years. Um, and I don't really care about this level of precision. Um, so I'm going to also create another column. So I'm creating two new columns here. Um, age at diagnosis years rounded or round. And so I'm using a function in here to take this function or create this variable from the other variable I just created, the other column I just created. Um, and the round function, this number here is just indicating how many um, you know, spaces after the, after the decimal point you want displayed. Um, and then I'm selecting just those three columns um, from my data uh, to show me. And then I'm showing that um, table one. So that is a lot of stuff that I just put down there. Um, give it a pause. You totally could do it. So somebody asked in the, um, uh, why not do it in one step? And you could totally do that. Like I could go in here and put the round function right there, but maybe you need it for some other, you want this level of precision um, for it, but absolutely you could do this in one step. Um, and just to, to demonstrate that I can do this. And I, I don't have this column anymore. So um, there we go. Same thing, same thing. So you can actually, um, when you're creating this new column, um, yes, exactly for Danielle's comment there that if it can be really, when you're doing these analysis and you come back to them like four months later and you're like, Gosh, I can't even remember why I created that or why I did all those things. Um, uh, uh, it, it can be very helpful to be explicit about what stuff is happening. Okay, so we only have 40 minutes. We're getting pretty close. Um, uh, and so I'm gonna pass it over to Daniel unless there's any questions right now. And, Oh, Daniel, I can't hear you. Hello. 
Okay, uh, I was just getting things set up. All right, so um, we so we sort of just went through like a small, quick example of like processing our data, um, doing some kind of calculation with it. Um, yes, there's many more things that you can do within tidyverse. Like another super common thing would be like recoding variables if you need to, uh, but using um, select, filter, and mutate are going to be used a lot in any type of data processing. Um, the other thing with this course today is more just trying to show you, like just try to demystify the programming aspect of it a little bit and just show you certain things that you might uh, find useful. Uh, but a, there are a lot more things that we won't have time <laughs> to show you today. So the next part that we're going to cover is um, getting frequency counts in, I know in a lot of public health uh, contexts, uh, two by two tables are super popular. Um, almost everything runs off of two by two tables, especially if you take like a intro B class. Um, so let's get ourselves reoriented on like looking at different views of our data. Um, so I showed you at the very beginning when we first loaded up our smoking complete data, the skim data set. Uh, and so this was like a great way to um, get for each different type of variable, um, the uh, number missing or some kind of descriptive statistic um, for the numeric ones, you actually get some sort of um, frequencies, uh, descriptive statistics out of it. So another thing that you can uh, do is uh, when you are creating two by two tables, um, the body of the table are going to be frequency counts. And so frequency counts only really happen or really only make sense when you're working with some kind of categorical data, right? So like, yes, you can count age if it's like a whole number in your data set, but like if it's some like blood reading, like a CBC count, um, you're not really going to count the different uh, values, unique values in your data set. Um, that's when you, uh, you're you treating it more as a continuous variable and not like a descriptive uh, discrete variable. So how do we create frequency counts of things? So there is in tidyverse a function called count. That's great. Uh, what you give count is the column that you want to count your variables in. So we can take our uh, data set and then use the pipe symbol, so smoke complete, then pass it, pass that data set into count, and then give count the column you want to count. So vital statistics is probably something we care about in our data set. So that's another thing. Count things that make sense to some question that you're um, trying to answer. For vital statistics, you here see that um, uh, there's alive and dead. And so another thing, especially if you're in like the two by two world or in the epidemiology world where things, a lot of the things that you're looking at is like a binary variable, like did this person get cancer? Yes or no. Or is this person a smoker? Yes or no. Like that binary aspect. If it's part of like some larger piece of analysis, even if you don't know the stats for it, like to do the statistics, it's a really good idea to run count off of the variable of interest, right? So you could end up in a data set where like um, out of a hundred people, 99 of them like don't have the disease and one person has the disease. And it doesn't matter what data set, what model you create, if the model just says, no, this person is fine, um, it's gonna work 99% of the time. And that's gonna look really good. Um, so this idea of like, the there's a statistical term for this and it's called class imbalance. And so if you like don't know anything about statistics, look up the column that you're actually using like as your outcome and then run a frequency count on it. That is going to help you and the statistician you work with um, like figure out what's going on with your uh, research question. Um, all right, so that is my spiel about using counts. Um, how do you count multiple things? So typically um, in a two by two table, you're counting two different um, categorical variables. And so in count, all you need to do is pass it the other column or multiple columns you want to count by. 
And so if we run this little block of code, you'll see that we don't really get like the two by two view. We get this in more, it's called quote unquote, like tidy view. So each row represents some combination of all of the unique values in our data set. So originally we had vital status, there was two values. The disease, there were three values for it. So two times three is six, so we have six rows. So we get a different row for each unique combination, and then we get a count for it. Um, this is useful, um, especially if you're trying to process this data further. Um, if you're used to looking at the like two by two table itself, the easiest way I found it to do is we have to leave like the tidyverse world a little bit. Um, and there's a different type of R notation um, that um, we will show you. And it's so everything up until now is being done using like the tidyverse series of functions, right? So we have to load up dplyr to use select, right? Um, you didn't have technically. If you wanted to pull values out of a column, you don't have to use the select function. Um, you can in R without doing anything. If all you want care about is the values of a column um, as like a numeric, like a sequence of its values, you can use the dollar sign notation instead of using select. Um, and so if I just select the if I just highlight the smoke complete dollar sign vital status, you'll see that this printout looks a little bit different from piping smoke complete into the select function, right? So if I um, con contrast this with um, smoke complete, then select, um, like these two things, print out on the screen differently. One actually is a one column data set of values. And then using the dollar sign, because it's just a single column, it is like a sequence or technically it's a vector of values. Um, so there's a little difference in the base R notation and tidyverse notation for a lot of things. But this notation ends up being really useful because if we say, um, take this column and the disease column, and pass that whole thing into a function called table, we now get the little two by two, or this is really like two by three table um, that we're most uh, used to seeing, right? And so now if this was something like, um, if this was something like does treatment affect disease outcome, um, you, you'll be able to do your sensitivity specificity PPV and PV like, uh, two by two table um, calculations off of. One other thing that you can do that's pretty useful um, when you table things is you'll notice that it's the same block of code and we're taking this table output and passing it into a function called add margins. All it's going to do is literally add the, the sum summation margins uh, for you. So even if you are going to manually calculate like sensitivity, specificity, positive predictive value and negative predictive value, um, you're gonna need the sums of like those rows and columns as part of your calculation. So um, even if you, you know, don't use R for anything else and you're using R to, you know, give you the set of values that you can plug in, uh, use R for that, it's great. Um, so um, that is sort of using like a different syntax notation um, and leveraging the rest of like, the R ecosystem or um, to help you with things. Um, I saw someone put a hand up, but then it went down. So I don't no, know. It was just applause for your amazingness, Daniel. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so um, the other thing, and you'll hear more about these talks, uh, more about generating tables in the R medicine talks. But I don't think I actually have table one. Uh, <laughs> uh oh, I don't think I actually have this data set. <laughs> yeah, I, know, I generated it up um, uh, at the end of wrangling, I think. Yeah, uh, yeah. Right uh, there. there we go. To okay. Um, 
uh, I know what's going on. Um, this is, I think this is, I think it's that. Nope, nope. There we go. Uh, I was like following along and not running <laughs> code along before. So um, we showed you a little bit about this uh, piping the raw calculations into something that prints out a little bit prettier. Um, what you can do is, let's say we have our table one uh, data set, um, and this is something that you've wrangled and processed and did all the calculations um, in R. There are a whole slew of other functions to help you make this data set essentially like publication ready, right? And there are a few talks that over the next couple of days that will point to uh, different libraries to help you with that. One of them is literally called table one. And so like that whole table in every uh, medical journal that is essentially like, these are the descriptives of our patient population. There are, once you get your data set and all those frequency counts made, you can pipe it into the table one function and it'll generate the, the table with like the proper um, collapsing of rows and columns. So it, it like formats pretty on a, um, on a paper. And uh, like what Ted said, GT summary is also a really, really useful one. Um, there are a bunch of libraries and tools that can help you uh, with generating tables and making them pretty. And so this is really nice because we've all been in that situation where we're almost done writing the paper and then all of a sudden we get a new data set and we have to regenerate all of our figures and tables. The more you can keep that stuff into R um, and all you have to do is fine tweak things at the very end maybe, uh, the less likely that you'll end up with data that's out of sync with whatever you published, right? So there's also going to be talks about um, using R and R Studio to generate PowerPoint slides. And we've all been in that situation where like you're, you're giving your talk and then you stare at your results as you're talking and then you say to yourself and or out loud, that's, that's the wrong figure, right? So we've all been there. And so R is a, there is that learning curve, but because we're using a programming language, if the data set updates, it can update the entire sequence of things that get generated from it. Um, yeah, uh, Ted, do you, do you wanna cover the, the, the janitor package? I guess that's really the last thing left before we sure. conclude. Sure. Do you mind just kind of scrolling down instead? Oh, well, oh. I guess I don't have I don't have the R Studio. Open, oh, okay. Sorry. All right. Cool. <laughs> so I will talk. Uh, so this is a package. It doesn't seem that useful when you're first starting out, but as you start to work with other people, you will realize that there are certain things that drive you mad about your collaborators. So your collaborators. So if you just run this um, code block here. So this is a similar data set to what we have, but um, do you notice some weird things about it? <laughs> about especially the column titles. <laughs> yeah, and and to some of you who've like never worked in R and like always been in Excel, you might not even realize that it's like something painful. Uh, but looking at those spaces in um, the column names can just wreak havoc because it's kind of like a special character um, when you're doing analysis. But when you're in Excel, right? Like it's all the time you're gonna find um, crazy symbols, dollar signs, backslashes because Excel will let you do whatever you wanna do. Yeah. Um, makes it hard though for analysis. Yeah. And kind of the example we have here. So, you know, say you have like you're, you're doing a multi center study, right? And um, there, everyone is supposed to report these same columns. But, you know, there's one group that they, ba they basically decide to do things their own way in terms of the naming. So this, this function that I'm going to show you from this package called janitor basically gives you a way to standardize names. So, um, if you go down here, so there is a function within the janitor package called clean names. So what you can do is when you pass 
basically we're going to take our bad column names for that the data set with the bad column names and we're going to basically make a data set with good column names <laughs> so um basically what happens is it gets rid of things like capitalization um, it, and it transforms spaces into things like underscores um, this is this is kind of the default behavior so based on how you like to capitalize things um, this behavior is called a snake case um, so everything is in lowercase and uh, spaces um, or white space is transformed into an underscore um, and when you're kind of when you're working with like kind of multiple groups, this helps to kind of standardize things. So your code, your 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 code hopefully will work um, across these data sets. So it's it seems like it's not that useful when you're first kind of starting out, but um, it's I would say this is like the number one thing. This and the case when statement. Um, these are the two things <laughs> that I, I, I recommend that you start kind of looking at next because they will make your lives easier. So case one, we don't have time to cover it, but it may, lets you make um, kind of makes you make, lets you make kind of cat, uh, continuous variables categorical, for example. Um, and it's it's just such a useful function that, um, you know, you'll probably use it almost in every like dplyr kind of pipeline that you build. Uh, that's pretty much it. Does anyone have any questions about um, about janitor? Oh yeah, and it does um, remove remove empty is super awesome as well. <laughs> so janitor is not part of the tidyverse, but it is an, such a great package. Um, that it's it's just it's pretty nice. Um, it also has this function called table, is which is spelled T A B Y L, and that works within a tidy workflow. Um, so, for example, uh, you could it basically lets you do these kinds of cross tabs. Um, oh, and thanks for pasting that, Sylvia. So these are these are kind of these good kind of next steps, and it's they're like as you kind of go on, you'll start becoming like a data ninja. You'll be able to kind of start manipulating things. And, you know, it it, it become it feels like a superpower. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you. <laughs> anything, anything else um, that people want to add about janitor or <laughs> anything? I mean, yeah, it is a superpower to like somebody send you an email like, hey, could you run that analysis on these numbers and you go into R and like look at that data and pop it out and you're like, yeah, here they are. 15 minutes later, it feels really great. Yep. The best, it, this is kind of the high, high level of data ninja, ninjutsu, but uh, is being able, being able to do a lot of these things in real time. <laughs> it is, it feels awesome. Um, and we do have a little bit more time. So unless Daniel or Ted, you have other stuff um, uh, uh, to talk about, I was gonna just show some stuff about rendering um, uh, documents. Um, and so we have been living in this um, uh, RMD, which is like an R markdown um, file. Um, and it allows, you might have noticed this like happy little knit button here um, that allows, uh, and if you click on it, you're going to see some different options here. Um, so what I want everybody to do is I want you to go over and click on this file here, the one that's the looks like a paper with the circle and RMD called knit preview and click on that and you're going to open up. Um, Oh, I forgot to install a package, guys. Um, so hopefully it will prompt you to install that package, but it might not. Ugh, rats. Um, uh, so this might mostly just be you guys watching me. But so I'm going to show you the, the base file is this um, the same thing that we showed, the little YAML header, the code chunks, text. Um, and the uh, R allows you, or this um, knitter package is, is what it's called, allows you to take that base um, file, the RMD, 
and put it into different formats. So you can knit it to an HTML file. And can you guys see my uh, new file that just popped up? Uh, I don't think so. I think so I, I see, don't I see the knit preview. Oh, you do see no. the knit preview. Oh, no, the, the pop-up didn't show up. So. Okay, I think I am sharing the wrong um, uh, type of screen. Okay, so you should now see this is what pops up. Um, and it's taken this file and knitted it to an HTML um, document. And unlike a Word or a PDF and HTML, you can have like interactive documents. So you can see here, I've um, created an interactive um, plot that you can like zoom in on and uh, see what the data points are. Um, you can knit a PDF. Um, you know, many journals want a PDF. You might want to put some of your stuff into a PDF for very many reasons. But right, like a PDF can't have interactive parts because it's as if it kind of were printed. Um, and then I can knit that to a Word document. And this is great, right? Because I might do um, uh, my document or do my analysis, but somebody else doesn't um, use R and they want to look at. Um, uh, the file in Word. And there you go. Like I took that and translated it into this with my pretty little graph. Um, so that is a bit much, um, but the way to like take your analysis, your code, your text, and transform it into these shareable documents, like I put everything up on my github pages i like when i before i had children i blogged all the time um i still i try to blog every once in a while um but uh it just makes it so easy to share and they don't have to be our users um and i think daniel hit on something that was key you don't have to become an r pro and use it for your entire workflow you just need to use it for what like is great for you um, and then, like, when we showed that roller coaster of R and you're like ups and downs, it's because once you get comfortable with one thing, you see all the other cool toys that everybody is using and you're like, oh, I want to wear that. And so you're just like constantly learning and expanding the circle, but you're like strengthening those core skills of like wrangling your data, doing your analysis, creating reproducible stuff. Um, there's just so much. Yeah. Um, I guess one thing we do want to talk about is learning communities for R. Um, so just want to mention R for data science is a really wonderful one. Um, so like, you know, they're just very, they're just a very welcoming community. Um, so if you think it's just, uh, let me see if I can find the, the address. Um, so if there's anything else anyone else wants to add, I will pull up R for data science. Somebody asked in the chat about, are there good resources to learn how to write loops for repetitive data wrangling steps? Um, yes. And there's also um, tons of other good techniques to get away from, um, there's, yes, yes. So you can look in the um, R for data science. Um, if you wanna do loops, I find if you want to do a certain process in Tinyverse, I often find like the best way to like get the exact result I want is I type in my question or a little blurb about it and then put Tidyverse, and then I'll get like a Tidyverse flavor answer. Um, Per is a great package. I don't, I'm like having an existential crisis about thinking about how data gets stored. And so I have to learn more about how lists work, yeah. how I use them in my own data, because right, like once you get really complex data, not everything is a beautiful, <laughs> like, you know, 
flat file. Like there's complicated things, different kinds of variables. Um, and so like per, per is my next thing to start to go into the trough yeah. of our understanding about. Yeah. So it's interesting because Had Headley and I actually had a discussion online about whether people should learn row wise or per. Row wise is kind of per light and it's in dplyr. And he said a lot of the tasks that you want to do in per, you can actually do in row wise. Um, I actually have a tutorial about that. Um, so just want to point people to this. Well, we, we should all kind of plug our resources. Um, especially the TAs, the TAs have done like some amazing things as well. So um, I'm just going to point to my ready for our course. Um, so if you wanna kind of continue on, this is a free course that's available to you. It's all done in our studio cloud. Um, and I know Sylvia has stuff and Daniel has stuff as well. Um, I think if, uh, if there's no other big questions about the resource material, I was thinking about turning off the recording so people can just like um, chat if it's or like come on to video and stuff. So okay. it, I think we're all in agreement with that. So I'm going to pause.